Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure and a real honor for me to introduce Professor John Clark as our fourth speaker in our Ilham Public Lectures, which has grown in strength and profile over the past one year. John's visit and the topic of his lecture this afternoon could not come at a better time. With the recent change, I don't know who wrote this for me. Uh, with the recent change <laughs> uh, in government, it is important to revisit the important role artists play in providing a critical voice of honesty, hope, and change from the early days of the anti-colonial movement. It also uh, pays to consider the compar by, uh, this comparatively by looking at historical developments in our neighboring countries. Uh, John Clark, of course, is a professor emeritus in art history at the University of Sydney, where he has taught for 20 years. His Asian, his book, Asian Modernities, Chinese and Thai Art of the, of the 1980s and 90s, uh, published in 2010, won the best art book prize in the Art Association of Australia and New Zealand in 2011. His most, his most recent book, uh, Modernities of Japanese, Art in 2013, and Contemporary Art and B at Biennales is scheduled to be published in 2018 from the National University of Singapore. Uh, he's currently working on a two-volume study, the Asian Modern 1850s to 1990s, scheduled to be published by the National Gallery of Singapore in 2019. Um, Radhan Saleh, and Juan Luna are the two major Southeast Asian European salon painters of the, eight, of the 19th century. They are also artists of the two great nationalist pictorial paintings about European colonial rule. The Arrest of Di Ponegoro, which is painted in 1857, and Spolarium, painted by Juan Luna in 1884. In today's lecture, John will compare the different ways that Radin Saleh and Juan Luna approach creating art in a colonialist context and examines how each made nationalistic statements about colonial rule while adhering to European norms. Without further ado, I'd like to present to you Professor John Clark, who will be delivering the, the, our fourth lecture. T-shirt on. Thank you. Yes, nice. Um, well, this is a very complicated story, and people who haven't got their own 19th century art in your National Museum, very, or very little of it, might be a little bit problematic. Uh, there is 19th century paint, oil painting in Malaysia, but it's buried in at least three royal collections, and the sooner that can be brought out and put on public display and thought about and studied, uh, the better. That's my little political plug for today. Um, I have to take advantage of being a guest. You're allowed to say things you know you can't say otherwise. Uh, Radha Tala and Juan Luna are quintessentially 19th century painters. They produced the Kapan Pangaran di Ponegoro, if my pronunciation is okay, uh, in uh, 1857 painted in uh, Java and the Spoliarium of 1884, painted in Rome. Uh, when we come to compare Sale and Luna, three features of their constituting context come into play. There were different kinds of colonialism in the Dutch Indies and the Spanish Philippines, and they had different histories. They're not just one kind of colonialism. The different relations of these colonial situations they had to metropolitan, that's to say, European-centered capital discourses and the local possibilities of producing pictorial discourse were very different, and we'll get a little bit of a hint about that as we go along, but not, it's not really the subject of this paper. Just a minute, I'll take it off this hinge here, which is some sort of getting in the way. So, as you can see from these two pictures, um, there are very different types. 
One is a relatively small history picture, the only one that we know that Rod and Sally painted, and we know quite a bit about Rod and Sally, so it's very likely to have been the only history painting he made. Painted uh, in Batavia, I, I, I presume we think it's by Batavia. I haven't actually asked the leading experts where they think it was painted, but Batavia. And, Radin, and Juan Luna's painting of 1884, which as you can see, is an absolutely enormous picture. And when we had the exhibition in, of Luna and uh, Rad and Sally in Singapore last year, which is the original place for the, pr the presentation of this paper, they could not bring the picture on the right to Man from Manila because it's simply too big. And it's a uh, general, uh, general state of preservation wouldn't allow it anyway. And the picture on the right is, as we, as we, I will see as we go along, is actually more typically a European history painting done in the middle of the 19th century on Roman, usually with some kind of Roman motif or sub subject matter, but about some other kind of conflict. Um, uh, and um, is what is called in, in, uh, in French and English a machine. It's an academy machine. It's a structure of uh, production which is used to generate the thematics. It allows you to talk about this very big historical material. The other problem which exists, a difference indeed, between uh, Indonesia as it was to become, although let's just remember that it only became Indonesia in 1949, and uh, um, uh, the Philippines, which, although under colonial rule, is a, is a unitary state, even at the time we're sp speaking of these two artists, um, is that they had different ed art educational possibilities. I won't say systems. European art had long held some prestige for Javanese courts, and there were a fair number of resident European artists in Batavia from the early 17th century. And indeed, one of Rembrandt's daughters went to Batavia as an immigrant, she died there, but there were other, quite a lot of other art activity in Batavia, or Jakarta as we call it today. So we're not, even though we don't have an art school system in Java until much later, and indeed it's not really a system with an art school at the head, it's more art education for the aristocrats in teacher training academies. Um, uh, we do have uh, an exposure to, uh, to European art in Java, which is uh, some long longevity. Here's a better picture, uh, better larger pictures of that. But, uh, we come back, we'll come back and look at that in detail in some moment. And there were bits of painting to be found around Indonesia and Java. And I'm not going to go into the details of these, but they're very interesting pictures. Just wanted to show you the range of material which can be found. Um, some are pictures of... Um, a European colonial eye type of naturalistic exp exploration, such as the Javanese dancer on the left, History of Java by Raffles. And then there are some very interesting pictures which were done in uh, Batavia, we presume, um, and bought by a Dutch, uh, sorry, by a Danish um, trading company and then eventually found their way into the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Paintings of Javanese officials we know they're officials because of the uh, taboos surrounding the batiks that they're wearing, um, which indicate they come from a certain court background. And this painting has a peculiar re resonance with some paintings done in Delhi, remembering that Raffles took an Anglo-Indian painter with him to Batavia. Very unfortunately, India in 1820, whenever it was, when Raffles was on his way back to Europe, the ship which carried most of his collection was destroyed. So we can't actually look in great detail. There's some stuff from Raffles which already got to London, but hands in the British Museum. And the other painting which really all we can do is put in the back of our minds, when we think about painting in the Philippines, there's lots of things we can say about it, but one of them is another history painting, which is in fact the earliest history painting, a painting of a historical event in Asia by, in a Western style mode, you might say by an amateur painter, or at least a local town painter in the north of the Philippines, called the Basi Revolt, painted in 19, 1821 in a series of 14 images of a revolt against the tax on, uh, I think it's called sugar palm toddy, the drink uh, manufactured locally. And there's a 
whole series of pictures of the revolt and the equally revolting Spanish execution of them, the, the, the offenders, which is shown in this series of paintings. Um, and if some of you are familiar with the work of um, Roberto Faleo in the Philippines, you'll know that this is a subject of some considerable interest to Indonesian contemporary art, uh, to Philippine contemporary artists, but I can't go into that today. Here's where we really start. This is what was existing in Java in the late 19th century. Remembering that there is no art school produced by the Dutch really until they funded uh, the Bandung Art School in, eight, uh, in 1949 and there on. In fact, until after independence. There's no art school. There are some teach courses taught for teachers and, te and teacher, teacher training courses and such as those that there were used drawings such as you see on the left uh, by actually produced by Rad and Sally and printed in Indonesia in the Dutch colony at the time and one, one of the very few people that was taught by Rad and Sally I'm sorry go back uh, which is the artist you see on your right who was a student of Rad and Sally around 1873 um, is this um, uh, aristocrat who was one of the people trained by the Dutch teacher training academies. Um, but there weren't very many of those, there were only four, I think there were only four in, in Indonesia. And so the difference with, between the nature, if you like, of the elite in Indonesia, as it was to become, and the Philippines is very great indeed. The, 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 the Indonesian elite did not have the same access to um, metropolitan codes, linguistic and visual, as the Philippine uh, elite did. However, that said, one has to remember that the structure of rule was so different between the two colonies that even though there was apparently this access to European imagery in the Philippines, certainly because it was sponsored by the Catholic Church, uh, there were also other restrictions. The Philippine elite, the Ilustrados, were not allowed to learn Spanish or at least the use of Castilian by Filipinos was highly controlled until the 1860s. And all, furthermore, the Philippines was divided into provinces which were controlled by separate Catholic orders. The priests were the intermediaries both between the people and God because they weren't allowed to speak Latin or learn Castilian. They had to go through the plea. The priests were the translators to the Philippine population. And they were also the intermediaries with the colonial government a really quite small colonial government in Manila because the priests were the ones who talked to their own compatriots. And there's a quite elaborate series of segregations of people according to their um, ethnic typification. There's a four, four category typification. However, there is a, something which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. There was another set of people active in the Philippines, which are the Chinese. Because Chinese settlers as craftsmen, uh, particularly in Manila, formed professional guilds. And the reason they formed professional guilds is they were allowed to convert to Catholicism. So they could form a professional guild and then they could have all kinds of uh, rights to set the prices of their works. There were guilds for sculptors, guilds for various kinds of craft work and guilds for painters. And out of this background, which began in the 18th century, was produced work by an artist called Damian Domingo who established the first art school, the first formal drawing academy. It was founded in 1821. Well, you can see immediately from that how long, how ancient, if you like, how well rooted the production of images in a European naturalist and then academy style was in the, Fili in the Philippines. It was really well established and there's some very, very fine 19th century oil painters by Austra uh, Indian, uh, Filipino artists. I can't go into them today. And this, these artists of a Chinese background were completely assimilated to, chi uh, uh, to um, Spanish mannerisms. But they're also they're the ground, if you like, the number of craftsmen clamoring for professional qualifications, which were provided by the Academy of Drawing and Painting, established from 1850, slight variation in between, 
between the, or the, day, the dates, the ordinances for this school and the actual establishment of the school was set out from the 1850s. Um, uh, so, despite some similarities between, in, uh, uh, between the Philippines and the Dutch Indies in the restricted access of the local population to the colonizers' language, which is important, and quite different to the situation in India. India had four art schools by the end of the 1850s. Let us not forget. Uh, um, and often established, certainly in Cal uh, Mumbai, as it's now is Bombay, and Calcutta were established with, largely with Indian funds, not with government funds, although they were supported and regulated by the government, the colonial authorities. Um, that these... Uh, uh, Codes of dissemination, which are carried by the literary culture, um, were also reinforced uh, by um, the limited circulation of, of, of images. But the, the, the real difference, of course, is that the Catholic Church in the Philippines was a major patron of art, which they, and, 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 and you could say also, actually, that the, um, excuse me a moment, that the, um, the um, Filipinos had a tradition of making small votary images called anitos, ancestor symbols. So they were used to having imageries. They had a, a kind of folk iconography, one which has been, to some extent, re restored by later artists like Roberto Faleo, for example. So there's a quite different relationship um, and a different depth of relationship to European painting, certainly, in the, between the two cultures. Now, the, the interesting thing about Rada and Saleh and Juan Luna is they fall into the category of artists who actually went to Europe to learn their métier. There are quite a large number of artists all over Japan, China, Korea, who never went to Europe but still learned oil, oil painting. So this is a basic distinction between types of artists in the Far East, those who learned at home and didn't go abroad, self-taught, used books, used manuals and so forth, imported materials, and artists who went to Europe because the ones who went to Europe somehow had access to the main character of the... I'll come back to that one in a minute. Oh, yes, we'll go back to that one, sorry. Um, Radin Salo went to the Netherlands. He didn't go to art school. It's a very big, important thing. But there was another way in which artists learned skills in Europe, really right through to the early 20th century, which was to learn in the studio of an artist. And this is the artist whose studio he learned in. And he, learned, he was in two studios from 1829 to 1834, or thereabouts. Uh, and you can see perhaps more clearly in the next pair of slides, the relationship between one of Rad and Salo's drawings, which is actually done in Germany later, but never mind, and the kind of Dutch uh, winter landscape, which was done in the second studio, a man called Schelfhut, where he learned, um, actually very close in time to the picture we see, this winter landscape we, we see about 10 years before that. Um, so, uh, we use the word academic painting, but in fact, um, it's Luna who has access to the academy and not... Um, oh, I pressed something then. Sorry about that. Um, it's Luna who has access to the academy uh, and uh, Saleh only indirectly through the studio training he was given by these two artists who did that. Here's the sort of thing that Luna had access to. The um, artist called Rosales, on whom, on whom there's a quite an interesting essay by a Spanish art historian in the Singapore catalogue last year, which is worth looking at if you're interested in seeing what kind of work, although it's art historically somewhat problematic, but never mind. Um, and um, this is the... It's done by sound, this thing, isn't it? Not by sound. Um, and um, he was the teacher of Alejo, the Alejo Vera, the artist on the right. Um, and this painting is of some importance. We'll go, probably come back to similar paintings in a minute because this is a painting which was done in Rome in the 1880s. Luna went to Madrid in um, 
1877-8 with his brother who was a violinist who trained at the, the Madrid Conservatorium and he went to the Royal School of Fine Arts, the one which has all the Goyas in it, by the way. So he would have been in, in a building with a, which has his own collection of Goyas. Um, and his teacher, uh, Vera, uh, was uh, a great influence on him and then took him to Rome for five years. We'll come back to the issue of Rome in a minute. Uh, He's much more, Luna is much more emplaced in the genealogy of associations between nameable academic painters. That's the, the real issue. Whereas the painters that Sally was associated with were much more studio painters who didn't have a particular lineage. However, there is a very big difference between Sally and Luna in that Luna, as a, as a young man, trained as a navigator, as a, as a, as a, a ship's pilot who brought ships into port. He did not train as an artist. He must have been talented to be recognized, but he didn't train as that. Whereas Saleh, from a very early age, possibly as early as eight or 12, accompanied, because there's a little bit of a problem about his birth date, um, Saleh accompanied the artist on the left, Payen, around Indonesia on his natural history drawing tours. Payen taught him, as you can see, a, he, certainly a young adolescent, um, how to draw realistically. And this is quite different from Luna. Uh, and um, this painting on the left, is, I, as far as I know, has never been exhibited internationally, and it should have been, because it's one of the earliest in situ paintings painted in front of nature by a European artist working outside Europe. The nearest, if you want to put this in art historical terms, it's very close to the first paintings done in nature by Constable in East Anglia in 1814, roughly there. Um, it's only six or seven years later. Um, so the, the, some, sometimes the artists in the colonies, as it were, were um, taking what were quite new approaches, recently new approaches to art away along with them. Um, but then again, there's another difference between these two artists. It's important to remember is that, um, sorry, I'll go back in there. Um, Saleh, um, was the first uh, major artist to exhibit at a European salon, which was the Dutch National Salon in 1834. And he's, I'll just very briefly put this in in case you think that's rather strange. In fact, the first artist to exhibit, I'm sorry, it's not very good to fix that. The first, first artist to exhibit at a European salon was the Chinese sculptor who exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1770. Uh, this is a painting of the Royal Academy Art Exhibitions of 71, 72. Uh, sorry, but that's got really is quite pixelated on that screen. Um, it's quite a detailed picture. Uh, Sally, uh, Luke, going back to the differences between them, Luna was actually quite hostile to um, the teachers that he had in uh, Madrid, uh, from Madrid, who came, who came to um, um, Manila in the 1850s. One of whom was this man, Saez. And you can see it's this sort of high contrast, very rigid, very high Catholic style. And it's almost uh, unpleasant to actually have to discuss about it. Uh, but Sale himself was very conscious about the difference between European art styles. Um, and he was also, uh, uh, I think I lost my place. No, I haven't. Um, he was also very perceptive about different European art styles, all of which are unfamiliar today because we don't live in academic oil painting supplied museums. But I'll read just what he said to give you an idea. In 1840, Sally wrote, the German school, the Dusseldorf school, which is essentially the school of the artist on the right here, um, produces splendid compositions, but their coloring is hard and they do not control their mid-tones. I also dare to say that the German painters are rather poets. The Dutch, in contrast, uh, are, are, are less poetic, but handle colors better. This is by this one of his Dutch teachers, Krusemann, done in Rome in 1823. The Dutch, in contrast, are less poetic, but can handle colors better in their paintings, which therefore appear more beautiful. 
I hope what I'm communicating here is the fact that there's no monochromatic, monolineal relationship with European art, although some of you will have noticed that these artists went to Europe 50 years apart, so we are dealing with artists going into a different art world at the time they arrive. Uh, and they come, in the case of Luna, they come with a very sharp view about what European art could be. We don't have a direct record of what R uh, Luna thought about art teaching, but we do have a direct record from his friend and peer, Hidalgo, who in 1879, that's two years after uh, um, uh, uh, Luna appeared in Madrid, um, wrote about, wrote a long detailed letter about the teaching in the Madrid Art School and he says, they're all very good professors but you must be sure that you can study there, Manila, under Saiz, is exactly the same, the material you study is exactly the same as what is taught here, neither more or less. With the difference that there you paint and draw much more comfortably than we do here, because here you have to have, because there you have the entire hall at your disposal, while here we can hardly pick up a bad corner, often enveloped in darkness, and we have to stretch our necks to see the model, and so on and so forth. So they were actually, the immediately ar arrived artists from the Philippines had a very sharp eye on the quality of the academic teaching they were receiving and the facilities where they learned. Uh, I don't want to leave this uh, Hidalgo letter without reading another part of it, which is very important and recurs frequently among Asian artists going to Europe from that time really until the 1980s. I've heard the same thing almost verbatim said by a Chinese artist about his first visit to the Louvre. Hidalgo writes in 1879, I do not want to tell you about the Museo del Prado because I have no more time. I will only tell you that it contains the most valuable collection of paintings, more than 3,000, that is found in Europe. And here's the real point. One leaves that building with a headache and despair in the soul because one is convinced of the little he knows that one is not even an atom compared with the colossi of art. For genuine artists who knew the discourse that they were working in to arrive at a major European museum like the Prado or like the Louvre later to find the quality of the work that they were looking at and think or try and think how their work might somehow work towards those standards or be in parallel with them or even be shown in the same space was a considerable psychological burden. Uh, of course, uh, Luna, sorry, we go forward. Luna had worked, we think, with copies of Prado paintings imported to Manila. The list exists of the artist, but no one's ever found any. But 19th century oil paint, academic oil painters, had a test in how well they could copy or work after the model of existing paintings. And here you see the painting of probably around 74 to 76 before he went to Europe by Luna. A very similar painting which appears in this 1890 photograph of his studio in Paris, which is here on the wall. So it, even if that's physically not the same painting, you could ask, uh, it certainly shows you his close relationship to what he'd actually modeled his style on. And al also, in a way, the kind of respect he had for what he was doing. Uh, and then we'll see that has consequences, uh, important consequences for his later work. Um, now let's go and look at their works a bit more carefully, because you've probably got a little bit of too much art history to begin with there. So this is Sale, around the time he's studying with these two Dutch painters in The Hague, painting a picture of, on the left, of the family of his patron, Bode, who later became the Governor General of the Dutch Indies and far after that the Minister of the Colonies and so forth. And it's a co commission portrait probably because the wife shown on the left with the child had died before the completion of the picture. So it's, in a way it's a kind of 
the commemorative ideal of this Dutch family, uh, done in a way derived from uh, previous examples of such portraits. And then you can see that these portraits in the, 19, in the 1830s and 40s were quite common. Indeed, the, po the portrait on the left, which was done in Amsterdam, as far as one can tell, um, is of a Dutch planter family in, 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 in oh, or probably on a visit, but anyway, from Batavia. So the association between the family portrait, which of course goes back a long time in Holland, certainly to the early 17th century, um, can be seen um, in, the actual, in the work that, that, that Salo was producing. Um, where are we going from here? Oh, yes. If you compare this portrait with portraits of the same married couple done by Crusimann, his teacher, then in Rome, you can see, in a certain sense, his debts. Um, he uh, seems to want to uh, accomplish portraits in a way which allows him to sort of place the person in a historical frame which is governed by pictorial discourse. Um, and also to sincerely and directly characterize the individual shown, something which is surely original. Uh, in uh, Indonesian or into what would become Indonesian visual culture, so it's the first exemplar of this kind of positioning. Um, this is by Krusemann, but we can see that working into the previous picture. Let's go back and have a look at it on the left. They're all shown in, they, they seem to have rather rigid facial expressions, but they're actually shown as individuals and personalized. Uh, and also, the, he uses angularity of pose, as you can see in the Krusemann pictures here. Following this, Salo will accomplish portraits of governors general, uh, largely done um, in The Hague before he moves to Paris, uh, before he moves to Dresden in 1839-40. Um, and um, these were governors general who were, in some cases, his, his friend, a very close relationship with Bode, as you can see on the left, the figure from the family portrait we've just seen, but also were historical reconstructions uh, such as an art, a person he could not have seen, which was Dendels, who was the last governor general uh, under the Dutch before the British took over, uh, and who was responsible for um, various kinds of developments, including the Great North Road across Java. Um, and these pictures were then copied. These portraits of governor general, governor generals were copied, or all small old sketches were made, which were circulated in Java and then go back to Holland. Of course, the big portraits of the governor's general, including the one we've just seen, the two we've just seen, were sent back to Holland in 1949. And only Cartier-Bresson was present. Don't forget, Cartier-Bresson was married to a Balinese. Is he Dav she Balinese or Javanese? I can't remember. He had a... Hmm? Java. Java. He was Javanese. He was married. His wife was a Javanese dancer. So there was a certain reason for him being there and maybe a certain cultural insight into Dutch colonialism, I don't know. Portraiture was a very important genre of 19th century academic painting, and this one that Luno himself also followed, but much more spontaneously and directly did he depict the complexities of the personalities he was involved in. Maybe just simply he was a better painter, better trained, I don't know. Um, here you see um, Victor Balaguer, in the commemorative museum to which a lot of very important paintings by Luna are kept, which are not found elsewhere, the late 19th century ones we'll come to, uh, and also a painting which was perhaps produced as an exchange or a sign of gratitude for an exchange which freed his brother from Spanish captivity uh, in the 1890s, the then Governor General of um, the Philippines. But he was, Blanco was a very liberal man in 19th century terms. Alongside these portraits, the artist over expanded to look at the ordinary people, which one is tempted to in, in interpreting Marxist or class terms um, directly, but if, of course this is a painting of people in the streets or the popular, pop, uh, the pop, the popular working population 
by someone who, although he did show interest in socialist and anarchist theories in a famous letter, um, was not really of the um, revolutionary type, if we can put it that way. And here we see a picture uh, or a study which exists from the picture on the right, which doesn't exist, which was destroyed, a great big picture um, showing the king and the people, in particular uh, an assault which took place during the revolution on the burial ground of the French kings in um, northeast Paris, northwest Paris. Luna also tried to cap ca capture the people as a subject through depictions of social events such as workers in the street or indeed the burial of a worker as you see and you can see that both of these pictures are in the Museo Balaguer uh, which is in the suburbs of Barcelona you can actually go there quite quickly and conveniently by train from Barcelona if you're ever in that part of Spain so do make a point of trying to see it because these are probably the first humanist socialist representations of the people in an academy manner by an Asian painter um, and uh, a quite large is one you want to believe is 200 by 304 so very worth, well worth looking at other interesting 19th century paintings there with, of, of course of which mo with which most of us are unfamiliar because they're Spanish or I don't think there's any other Filipino artist there and here is a comparison between um, Juan Luna's Parisian Reich painted in 1892 and the unknown heroes painted the year before in 1891 and Parisian life is a small picture and very important to look at the size of oil paintings even though I'm putting these at the same um, projected size to make the comparison clearer um, but he's actually taking people out of their social context and individualizing them and this also is a bit sort of voyeuristic uh, because these three guys are Filipinos <laughs> looking at this Parisian beauty slash prostitute, I suppose, uh, in a cafe. I mean, she's a woman by herself in a cafe, so they may have thought she was fair game for their amatory attentions. Um, but um, it's, it's, it's... Sorry, we am going to put it again. Big pardon. Uh, and this painting was restored to the Philippines about 10, 15 years ago, bought an option by the National Pension Fund, and then given to the National Gallery. Yeah. Uh, it had gone missing. And um, if you look at the picture on the right, I'll just read a very short citation from, excuse me, from um, uh, Luna's letter to Rizal, one of the people in this picture on the left. Um, approximately the same time, the same year anyway, 1891. He said, I am now reading Le Socialisme Contemporain by a, 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 a La Velle, I don't know, I'm not quite sure what the French pronunciation is, in which he has summarized the theories of Karl Marx, La Salle, Catholic Socialism, Conservative Evangelical Socialism, etc. The book interests me very much, but what I would like to do, and this is the important difference with a, with a facile sort of Marxist class analysis, but what I would like to do is uh, to highlight the miseries of contemporary society in a kind of divine comedy. A Dante who had walked through the workshops where one can hardly breathe and where men, little kids and women, live in the most wretched conditions one could imagine. And he'd experienced these conditions. Firstly, because he knew the laborers in the part of Paris where he lived were largely Italian immigrants. And uh, I don't know if they've entered a public collection yet because the owner died, but there's a whole set of drawings of these people in the streets, all with annotations which indicate they're Italian uh, in the former Eleuterio Pasquale collection. Um, and um, there's certainly a rigorous kind of differencing of his, from his previous practice. But portraits are not just simply of people. Portraits are indices of belonging. Portraits function to, de to define the artist's self-worth, the artist's intentions, and their linkages with the world. And we have a self-portrait of Saleh from 1835 on the left, which was exhibited in Singapore and is now in Matan. 
as some of you know. Um, but it's quite interesting to look at it in comparison with another self-portrait, not so far apart in time, by an artist who we used to meet later in Paris, Meyer, who was a seascape artist. And you can see the same pose, the same jocular informality, the same self-confidence even, and the same direct eye contact with the viewer. So this is a quite interesting relationship to uh, self-representation which we see probably for the first time in an Indonesian, an artist from, sorry, from the Dutch Indies. The point is really that Radha Sally is in, at ease with his social station and is conscious of the status he has in the world in which he moves. Portraits indicate uh, the ease and playful wish to ironize uh, about positions held by himself and his hosts. And it's in, in, in really important to remember that Radan Saleh was not a social inferior. He was not a colonial slave. He was actually the social equal of many of the aristocrats with whom he lived and worked. And this was rather uncomfortable for an English observer who was the wife of the future Governor General of India, the Vice Viceroy of India. And I'll read this uh, description for you. In the Grand Duke of Baden's room, I saw one of the works of the Java Prince Ali, who lives at Coburg like a tame monkey about the house. Lord Aberdeen was so taken aback the first day to see this black in his Turkish dress, instead of handing us coffee, quietly take some of the drink himself. When others are not in uniform, he sheds his turban in gold, and silver, and becomes a regular German dandy, as you can see on the left. He has studied painting with great care in his picture of the Duke and Duchess of Coburg with a real black servant, and heaps of dead game is a good imitation of Landseer. Well, those of you familiar with 19th century pa British painting will know that Landseer, Landseer was a manufacturer of cliched pictures of deer for Queen Victoria and so forth, but um, this woman, this, this vice-regal aristocrat, is actually being forced to recognize the quality of the person that she's looking at. And that you can see in various portraits which were done of Radan Saleh. One by Dutch artist Schroel, who he knew in Bresden, probably around 1840. And he's presented as a professional, competent, you know, uh, interesting type of artist with a kind of twinkle in his eye. Or in the other portrait, by, which is now in Riga in Latvia of 1842, very slightly later, where he, for the benefit of the viewers, struts around as a Javanese prince. But he's, he's putting on an act. In one case, he's a professional with identifying with his role. In the other, he's identifying with his social perception as an equal, perhaps. And it's very important to remember that Germany is not a place in the middle of the 19th century. Germany is a series of disintegrated kingdoms, or using the German language, where German, the language of German, functions as a cosmopolitan language for communication with, between these different kingdom, people from these different kingdoms. Um, furthermore, in 1843, in a letter to Bode, his erstwhile sponsor in Holland, he mentions he's frequenting the circle of a Major Friedrich Anton Serra, who we see on the left. Serra is a type it's difficult to identify anymore because he belongs to that landed gentry, European landed gentry, which was liberal, in many ways influenced by the ideals of the French Revolution, certainly the Enlightenment in general, who had an extensive cultural network. Wagner, Schumann, uh, and others, uh, the, we see in a moment, uh, Thorvaldsen, all came to his house. It is certain that Saleh heard Schumann play with his wife uh, at Sarah's house. And this is the place where, so I'm not going to show it you, where, where, where actually Saleh was given room to make a, a small, well, it's a small, it's called a mosque, but it's actually a small prayer room in the middle of, the, the, the fields, but it's definitely of Javanese inspiration. I'm not showing you today, you've probably seen it before. Um, 
And he was also, he also knew the, Dan the famous Danish sculpture. These are artists of, you know, artistic relevance appears to have disappeared entirely, but they, they, these were, if you like, leading artists of their day. And for us, it's very interesting that Vermeer, the artist whose sculpture is, sculpture portrait by Thorwaldson is shown on the right, was visited in 1845 after Saleh had moved to Paris. There's a lot of relationship with the work of Vernet, in particularly the typical tigers, lions, horsebacks, huntings, and so forth, which were the stock of the French salons and which Saleh partly uh, acceded to. I'm only going to show you one set of these images, but it'll give you a rough idea. Um, Vernet produced this, rather, for the time, rather famous picture of a man being tied to a horse and beaten, the horse being beaten, him sent off to, to ride through the forest. Um, Mazeppa was a naughty boy. He'd fallen in love with the wrong courtier and was punished uh, very, very vigorously by being sent off die, it was thought. In fact, he survived, I think. Uh, but this is a subject of a long romantic poem by um, Lord Byron. Uh, you can find it on the web very easily if you type in Mazeppa, the text will come up. Um, and this theme of the, the person tied to the horse or the savagery taking place on the horse was used by Ryden Sally, first of all in the drawing uh, of 1842, which survived the Second World War. I think it must have been buried, one of the ones sent to buried in the mines. And then a uh, very close uh, relationship to this um, on the, the attack on the uh, horse or the waterfall all falling into space, as you can see. This is a sort of thematic an allegory, of heroism, an allegory of sacrifice for love. I don't know, but some kind of allegory. But, but probably from this time, the 1840s, the early 1840s, Sally started playing with allegory, which we, as you will see became very important later on in his work. Portraiture for, for, for Luna, although he did official portraits and tried to characterize individuals, was much more domestic. Luna painted his brother after, shortly after his arrival in Madrid and also um, painted, did self-portraits um, as you know, the young, budding, uh, able artist we see here. Luna also allowed himself to be portrayed, as you can see on the, on the left of this picture, um, as the heroic, competent uh, man from outside who showed them how he did it. It's sort of the only equivalent I can think of this picture is Lewis, Ham Lewis Hamilton winning the World Motor, I mean, Motor Racing Championship. It's that sort of picture. I've done it. I've got there. And he's been pr 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 privileged by um, his Spanish peers by that recognition. In fact, um, Luna spent five years in Rome. We always think of the 19th century as the, the century of Paris and everybody going to Paris because we swallowed this dream of Impressionism against the Salon. In fact, Impressionism doesn't become dominant in the Salon until, uh, or dominant, I should say, in the French art world. Not Salon wouldn't be the correct expression there because there's two artist societies by the late 19th century. Um, until the, until, uh, really, until just before the First World War. I have to remember that. So um, uh, these are a group of Filipinos, important writers and painters, um, in, in and sculptors, um, and two um, Spanish. Um, I'm not quite sure who the right. This is. There's these two. These are actually Spanish um, sculptors who um, collected some writers, some of the lunas, and took it, took them home. So this is what is called, if you read the biographies of Picasso, only very slightly later in time, is called a tertulia. A tertulia is a group of men who meet together once a week. It's a very important Mediterranean phenomenon, but it's found uh, in different Mediterranean societies. Um, I don't know if you've been around the Greek areas of Sydney, but there's men talking to each other every morning over their coffee, like five or ten of them. It's, uh, it's a sort of sodality that people come together to talk about world, the world, and, the, and it's very gender specific. It's men. Uh, and this is their, their Filipino version with a couple of Spaniards uh, in 
in Rome. Um, the reason why he was famous is because he um, won the grand prize with the Spoliarium, which we'll go back to later, uh, at the French Academy. Uh, sorry, this the Madrid uh, uh, Salon, as it were, the, the annual association uh, uh, prize. Um, but he didn't win the grand prize, he won the gold medal. Spanish are quite nice, they have gold, silver, and bronze medals, and then they have a medal on top of that, which is not called gold, which is called the grand prize. And he wasn't given it, unfortunately. Um, right. Meanwhile, back in Germany, the other alternative role for an artist was being defined by dear old Rod and Sally. Right, so we have to be very careful about our reading of historical context for art because they're not ours and they're not necessarily what we'd want for the artist. And they may not actually somehow fit into a convenient pattern of uh, salon, anti-mainstream and avant-garde which we see established later on in the century. Salon was the social equal, or at least accepted as a social uh, partner, of Ernst II of Saxe-Coburg. Ernst II of Saxe-Coburg was the brother of Prince Al Albert. And when Albert came to Coburg in 1844 and Queen Victoria came in 1845, they were, in, uh, Sally was invited to come and see them in the UK and he went to see them at Osborne, their residence on the Isle of Wight in 1847. Perhaps it was this familiarity with and mostly acceptance by this aristocratic milieu which enabled Sally to feel distanced from Dutch controls after his return in, to Java in 1852. Maybe he thought he was a member of an aristocracy or at least the equal of an aristocracy through his professional skills, sorry, I've got that wrong, uh, which um, um, gave him a distance from the local colonial situation. And he was subject to quite a lot of abuse when he went back to Java. And there is a difference, really, with Luna. Luna is either a competent professional painter, as you see in the picture on the left, or from 1895 until his death, a kind of tragically split revolutionary, or at least if not a revolutionary, a, a radical decolonizer. And um, we don't see, I think, Luna trying to put himself in the same class as his Spanish um, uh, colon colonizing peers. But he does have good relations with some of them. And indeed, the queen, Isabella, was very annoyed with him not being given the grand prize in 1884. And she immediately commissioned this painting, this grand history machine again, which shows the Battle of Lepanto. The Battle of Lepanto was when the Spanish uh, defeated the Turks. Uh, so, the, the, of course, all of Spanish painting, particularly Spanish history painting in the 1880s, is tinged with this pride at having expelled Muslims from Spain. We'll see that in a moment very clearly. Uh, but uh, it seems to me that the difference between Saleh and uh, Luna is much more fun, apart from all the technical issues we've discussed and the, the social reception and so forth, is much more to do with who he was with. It seems Luna, how well, he had lots of Spanish friends and so forth and was praised proper, properly by some of his Spanish peers, painting peers, he spent his social life with his friends who were Filipinos, both in Rome and in Paris and in, uh, partly in Madrid. And you can see that in the tenderness which is devoted to this picture, who I've been told subsequently is not his wife, but I think it is, um, in 1887. And then some sort of intimate, domestic inter intimacy is creeping into his, some of his Roman painting, Roman style paintings, which you see on the right. Uh, 
This is quite unlike Radin Saleh. Radin Saleh thought he mastered being a foreigner, being in a foreign country. And I want to close this session, this section, before I go on to look at the two major paintings we've probably been waiting for, um, by a little citation. Radin Saleh actually wrote an autobiography in German, which was destroyed. It was dispersed, reconstituted by somebody, and then lost during the Second World War. But bits of it have remained. And I'll read just a little bit of this, but I want to alert, your, uh, alert you to the presence of this document. A saved extract reads, two signs opposite to each other, and yet both light and friendly, put their magic spell over my soul. There, the paradise of my childhood in the bright sunshine, washed by the Indian Ocean, where my beloved one lives and where the ashes of my ancestors rest. Here, you're talking about Germany or particularly uh, Saxony, here, Europe's luckiest countries, where the arts, sciences, and educational values shine like diamond jewelry, to where the yearning of my youth finally brought me, where I was lucky enough to find friends within the noblest circles, uh, friends who replaced father, mother, brothers, and sisters. Between these two worlds, my heart is split, and I feel urged to offer both sides my loving thanks. I believe that I can do that best by portraying my friends, my friends in Europe, the simple, innocent life and happiness of my people at home, and by outlining for my countrymen a picture of the wonders of Europe and the nobility of the human spirit. Well, obviously, nobility has a double meaning here. Aristocracy is implied. So here we have one artist who is living in the Philippines all the time. He's working in Europe, and another artist who's trying to constitute himself as living between cultural identities when he's mastered the German one. Let's leave it there. But it's a very interesting difference between these artists. And I'm sure many of you who've studied or talked to artists who live abroad will recognize this in your friends. Uh, and I could, we could think of endless examples of this. Now let us have a look at history events. The rest of Diponogoro is the only history painted by Salo. It is formed by previous exemplars of artists more directly in the domain of the production. The genre, genre is a type of painting, uh, a type of history painting in this case, in Europe, which has a long antecedents, going back to the late Renaissance. But there's actually a physical copy which Saleh must have seen at some time, which is this painting on the left by a Dutch painter working we don't know what he used for his material, visual material, but only working from presumably recording uh, journal jottings of some of the officers involved, the arrest of de Ponogoro, uh, the event which took place uh, in 1830. And I'll come back to that date very shortly, I think. Um, however, uh, um, Radin Saleh, depicts this event quite differently. Yeah, he has into slavery. It's taller. And we're standing on this side. Okay. Here, the Dutch general is standing on this side. And he's looking at him, start looking slightly up, obviously, in the position of dominant, so the dominant is shown slightly by physical positioning, and he's physically smaller. But uh, we find that the representation of the Dutch general, or at least my colleague Werner Kaas has carefully identified, that the rep representation of the Dutch general is quite specific. First of all, the Dutch general is shown on the left side. He's on the left of Radan Salah. That's the inferior side in Java. Right? Then he's shown as ugly. People who are ugly are evil in Javanese popular cultural belief. These are all points raised, by, raised in various papers by my friend Werner Kaas. But this is the interesting thing. Here is this history painting being done in Indonesia, but Saleh in uh, um, round about, um, uh, before he left Holland anyway, um, uh, has seen the picture on the right. 
1841. He must have seen this picture round about 1845 because it was toured to Dresden. There's no record, direct record of him having seen it, but the person who organized the showing of this picture was Seren, the guy we've just seen. And here we walk, what are we looking at? Well, it looks just like you know, some event, some history event. What does it matter what it's of? It's, you know, it's one of those machines. Well, this is a picture of the uh, splitting of the uh, kingdom of abdication of Charles V of Spain, who owned parts of the Netherlands, uh, by a Belgian painter or painter who is to become known as Belgian, called Gallet. And Charles split his kingdom uh, to, um, uh, as he thought, ensure its survival. And it's an allegory for what happened to Holland in, the se in 1829-30, the same, uh, remembering that Diponogoro was arrested by the Dutch first, by, defeated and arrested by the Dutch in 1830. This splitting of the kingdom of Holland and Belgium took place at the same time as the arrest of Diponogoro. Um, and um, an insurrection by Belgium against the, against the Netherlands, which was only successful because of the intervention of France, as it happened. France sent an army which looked over the border and frightened the hell out of the Dutch. So, having been defeated in the Napoleonic Wars 30 years earlier, they would have probably been very frightened. Now, there, there are, I'm sorry, it's slightly pixelated. The, uh, Preparatory sketch for the arrest of de Ponogoro survives. And it shows the composition was indeed in, in, in originally intended to include this portico, which has been taken away. And I can't show you on the people on the side, but the actual representation of a Dutch general is much more naturalistic. So that tends to indicate that the physical placement of the general here is Stands from the position of evil. How many Dutchmen are on this? There are some Dutchmen on this side, presumably Salé had a conception of the good Dutchmen and the bad Dutchmen. And it's possible that this is Salé, although he includes the self portrait, it's not sure. There's no way of no really knowing. Um, it could be, could not be, it might not be. Um, but before Salé left Holland, and here we have to think that pictures are not exactly always telling us what they seem to be. He did this picture in 1849, which was exhibited in Dresden before he went back to Europe. A pair of tigers in ambush view a wandering family, somewhat on the lines of Joseph and Mary in exile with the Christ child, beyond which is the temple of Borobdur. I'll put this example because I may not be quickly apparent to his Borobdur. Here's the family going off into the wilderness, probably into exile. Here are the tigers flying in with them. Oops, that's the wrong button. So, the above which is the setting sun. So, what's going on? Well, it's obviously not a direct representation of a family disappearing. And if you remember, it's uh, very close to the, in, in time, to the picture, the time you must have seen the. Uh, allegorical representation of the, the abdication of Charles V. Werner says in a German text, over Borobdur stands the pure light of the sun, of non-existence, the goal of the spiritual journey. If we accept this interpretation, this symbolic interpretation, or allegorical interpretation, then the picture illustrates the Javanese philosophy of spiritual transformation as the existential task of human beings. We're in the realm of allegory, but we're in the realm of a much clearer allegory, much more literary allegory, allegory with uh, Juan Luna's Spoliarium, which deploys an image from a historically reconstructed Rome of the fallen, fallen gladiators' bodies, which are stripped and disposed of. But it's based on the literary interpretations of the text behind it. I won't go into it. The broken bodies and their posthumous material treatment 
now clearly appear as a metaphor for the subjection of the Philippines by Spain. And there is little doubt that this is what the expatriate Philippine community in Madrid thought when it was awarded the gold medal. Which, as I say, was not the best medal or the highest medal of the time. Um, I'm going to jump a few slides here, just to go on a bit. Oh, sorry, I can't jump that one. Um, this history painting lies in the field of mid-19th century Spanish history painting. And this is the fall of Granada, the last, Spanish king the last Muslim kingdom in Spain. And it was the subject of a whole series of historic paintings, including the Battle of Lepanto, which you've seen, which privileged the Spanish state as the continuation of the um, 15th century Spanish uh, kingdoms. They weren't all one state that, that, at that time. So um, we're actually dealing with a world where paintings are put together uh, from a kind of historical consciousness of grandeur, but also, as it were, um, from a uh, um, rather spurious historical interpretation, or at least a very particular and, pri 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 oh, as you now see it, um, privileged interpretation. Uh, now, where are we going? Going here, that's right. Um, in fact, these paintings fall into a series of painted grand paintings, both in Spain and in France, of colonial conquests. One of Algeria on the top left, and one of Morocco on the top right and on the bottom. All wars accomplished uh, in the 1840s, but they're there, and that's the pre, that's the an, and if you like the, the antecedent to the history paintings of the 18, 1870s and 1880s. And it's very likely that the picture in the bottom. Uh, would have been seen by Luna in Rome, and the picture on the top left would have been seen by Luna in Paris later. Uh, this is another, this is the, unfortunately he died very young, so uh, his fame is kind of lost because he developed the painting in the late 19th century. But Fortuny, I'll be careful, there's two Fortunis, his son is a famous designer. Um, had a studio in Rome where this picture was in the back. And this studio was visited by all sorts of people. So we're, we're beginning to see here a kind of history painting which, of colonial conquest, uh, which was much more prevalent than has been discussed in art history. And I'm not in particularly interested in it myself, but I think I should make the point anyway, having seen these things. Also, of course, um, sorry, do we get, yes, that's right. Also, of course, uh, Luna, for the uh, spoliarium, must have seen Goya in the Prado. He must have seen these pictures. And here we see human sacrifice in a modern secular war context being, as it were, equated with the sacrifice of the uh, gladiators and then with the Spain, Spain as vic uh, with the Philippines victim. And there are quite a lot of links between Luna and Goya, um, although I haven't seen any Filipino text. There may be somebody who has studied this in detail. There's another series of relationships. With, uh, when uh, Luna went back to, the Fili went back to Spain in the 80, early 1890s, uh, after living in Paris, and started doing a series of works of, in a steelwork in factories in Bilbao, which is a big steelworks and shipbuilding place in that time. And there seems to be some sorts of relationships with pictures uh, by Goya of the same sorts of industrial working schema. Unfortunately, I, this half I, hypothesis that that he saw the picture on the left is not demonstrable because uh, I've talked to the Frick collection and the painting had moved around and it was very likely couldn't have seen it. But there are there's certainly a stylistic resonance there which is worthy of continuing. And uh, I'm going to jump all that. Uh, these history paintings also have their counterparts in Russia. And because the Russians taught the Chinese how to do history paintings, they also have their counterparts in China in the 1950s. 
Uh, so there's a lineage between uh, history paintings done in Rome and these, anti these colonial um, record pictures of battles and revolutionary pictures of after the Russian Revolution. Very particularly because, because Ilya Repin, this picture, went to see Fortuny's studio in Rome. So he knew what Fortuny did. And you find it in his students, like Brodsky, who is a teacher of the Chinese painter Maximov, who taught in Peking in 1956. So there's a, there's a whole range of connections here which have not been explored, and I want to bring them out. But I'm really going to talk now about the problem of modernity, and that will be a bit of a talk show here, my friend. So finally, in conclusion, how are we going to use an idea of Asian modernity? Uh, how would an idea of Asian modernity shape our understanding of artists who spent so much of their working lives in Europe or appropriating European painting? The question of looking at it from a European point of view like that in many ways poses the problem of Asian modernity in Euro-American terms. Modernity does not, believe, does not begin with the modern as recognizable in Euro-America. We have to say that. The modern is a relationship between a new lived experience and the forms chosen or developed to represent or express this. Nothing is more intellectually crude and anti-historical, as many European art historians are prone to do, I should say, I left that out in my text, than to think that mod the modern has something to do with the relegation of the material discourse of the artwork in favour of its conceptualisation. This is the whole problem of contemporary art. It concept puts concept before the material of the work. I don't agree with it, and I think it's anti-historical. Asian modern artworks are often grounded in the historical fact of the subject. Recognition of the subject is an essential element in this rep representation. That is, a local subject, however much it fits into the selections of an existing pictorial discourse, renders the work other than the practice and codes from which it's derived. But this otherness is for a set of practitioners and a specific audience usually the local elite in the first instance. And that's why, because the, there's an intellectual gap between what the elite can perceive and what the artist is doing with somebody else's art discourse that misunderstandings arise. Uh, particularly art historical ones. Let's go back or go to the implied distinction that's involved between comparing these two artists. If the artist is not engaged in the literal deployment of allegory, he or she often stands above the kind of colonial interpretive structures which authorize the work for the colonialists. The artist therefore tends towards a highly mobile and ironical position. One always thinks, one's looking at right inside, he's moving around, he's somewhere else in the room, he's not there as this colonial product that a certain kind of literalist or materialist artist who would produce. Of course, such irony most eloquently displayed, was most eloquently displayed by Saleh sending to the King of Holland the representation of a famous colonial imposition, the one, the arrest of de Ponogoro. That picture was sent to the King of Holland by Saleh. And it's structured to have a quite a different interpretation to the previous work by the Dutch artist Pienemann. And it lets us think that Saleh is standing outside and quizzically examining the colonial exchange, and there's textual evidence for that as well. Whereas another position to that of the aristoc aristocrat ironist is that of Luna, the independent resistant and conspirator who professionally is professionally bound up with higher national goals for which sacrifices of a very important kind were made. Finally, among those who did go abroad to enter the visual cultures of the colonial master, therefore, Saleh and Luna, rather than being seen as opposed types, should indicate two alternative strategies for adjusting to the same set of problems posed by the visual discourses of the colonial masters. One was aristocratic and ironic. You can see that in this late photograph of Saleh. One was professional but ultimately tragic. Unfortunately, we only have a copy by a student of, of his self-portrait. How far to appropriate colonial discourses and how much 
And under the 19th century conditions of high European imperialism, how far a new kind of cultural authenticity could be provided, which was not entirely in the sway of the other. They're talking about this dilemma through their self-portrait representations. Thank you. Do I get questioned? I get questioned. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> You're going to ask me nasty questions. I'll try. I'm trying to be nasty. Okay. That's fine. No, I have, yes. He's getting his rebellion. Yeah. <laughs> we have a long relationship. No, thank you, John. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, let me get my thoughts. So, no, thank you very much for your lecture. Really, really enjoyed the nuance and uh, the nuances in your comparison that you've set up with this sort of like polymath figures like Radan Saleh and Juan Luna, right? You know, I, I like the fact that you actually highlighted that they speak multiple languages, yeah. and Radan Saleh even wrote an autobiography in German, yeah. German, right? You know, these de details are almost in some ways um, like confirm my kind of suspicion for a very long time that we read someone like Edward Said's Orientalism very, very poorly, in fact. <coughs> oh. So poorly in this part of the world. <coughs> uh, since I've written a critique of Said, <coughs> published in Malaysia, actually. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, I, I, I think you have to speak into the microphone. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Is this, is this on? Uh, that's on. Yes, it is. Since I wrote a critique of uh, Said a long time ago in the early 1990s, and it's published, <coughs> it was published in Penang, in uh, USM. Um, I would like to underline the fact that um, whilst uh, Said, uh, Said's criticism of colonialism and the culture of imperialism was timely, it was also highly distorting. And there are serious problems with it, um, particularly his use of the notion of text. And it's encouraged a whole bunch of post-colonial people in, in the Western Academy to gain power on the back of it. Uh, because um, almost any, you could, always, you could see that in the British colonialist art show in Singapore last year or the year before. Um, as a way of kind of not looking, not paying attention to the details of what the artists were actually doing and why they were doing it in that context. That's what I want to say. Yeah. But, um, it's interesting that you actually mentioned, uh, sp you actually pinpointed specifically at um, academics working, uh, post colonial academics working in a Western ac academy. Yeah. Right, uh, it's almost as if it goes against uh, what that Turkish scholar Arif Derlik, who is sort of like said something about along the lines that post-colonial post-colonialism really sort of like came about because yes. um, you know third world natives began to sort of like enter the European or uh, uh, Euro-American sort of like academies. Do you want to sort of like say more about that? Is that the only moment you seem to be suggesting people, a different? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think people seem to think about culture under colonial rule as necessarily a forced intervention, a forced imposition on the local culture. Well, it does have that aspect. There's no denying it. But culture is a little bit broader than just the, the impositions of a hegemon. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly colonial culture, or it's not like, for example, um, the culture of the People's Republic of China today, where standards are imp imposed from the top right down to the bottom. Colon colonies don't work that way. They can't. The colonial regime is too weak. Mm -hmm. You have to think of colonial rule, I think, as an in interposition, as a sort of intervention, but not as an imposition. Yeah. Well, that's what I, I've tended to think of it as anyway. Oh, it's a sort of like intervention, almost the same way as, you know, like in some ways that sort of brings me back to what you have mentioned in your lecture, besides sort of like pointing out that in their respective sort of like visual regime in the Dutch East Indies and, you know, the Spanish Philippines, which you have argued to be very different in nature, they were, I think both artists were also operating 
within very different time periods across the long 19th century. It's a long 19th yeah. century. Yes, so I Saleh can. almost at the start of an imperial expansion of the Dutch in Java, and Luna at the end of Spanish rule, right? They operated within a period of immense social political change, and this might account for their strident comment on colonialism, but it's very different from, say, say Malaysia or a Malaya back then, which you hinted to contain sort of like portraits of, say, royalty. Um, I, I, well, I don't know. Like I mean, we don't know, do uh, we? But no great sort of like we nationalist... We suppose picture. it's there, but we haven't been shown it, because uh, it seems that... Uh, well, some of them are in Singapore. Some are in Singapore, yes, right. it's true. It's and I, and I, 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 I'm presuming it's not great painting, but there's stuff there to look at and to be discussed and to be understood. And, um, I mean, we know a lot, um, we know at the, at the very end of this, this, this period in the 30s, there's a lot of Malay town painters who master oil painting. Mm -hmm. Now, whether they just start doing it because drawing becomes part of the, the curriculum, mm. I think and there are a number of technical schools that were established and technical in the 1920s. Schools and so forth. Right. Technical drawing in technical schools and also curriculum-induced right. revealing of artistic skills mm -hmm. um, is a feature of modern education systems. And insofar as there was a modern education system in Malaya, which I never studied, mm -hmm. um, I suppose those people would be around, but they've never been the subject of art history, as far as I know, or of full-scale exhibition. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Does anyone have any question before I sort of continue to hog the mic? Yes. You mentioned the differences between Saleh and Luna, and you know the fact that one one had an aristocratic uh, aristocratic view and the other had a uh, a foreign view. Was it professional? How they call it? Well, so. In the context that they were accepted, was it because Saleh had a patron and therefore he entered thinking that he was at a higher level, whereas Luna, and, and that's the first question. And the second question is, do you see that um, appear visually in their work? I mean, if you didn't know the background, would you, would you look at the work and say they're different? That's a very decent question, um, but uh, not easy of reply. One has to remember that Saleh was in the pay of the Dutch government from the moment he came to Holland in 1829 through until his second visit to Europe, which was uh, 1877, I think. Uh, so um, Saleh may have had a different idea about what it meant to be sponsored by the government, as it, in terms of he was the king's painter, uh, and also, that's a, a formal title he had, um, and also um, his work largely being purchased or supported by the Dutch official class. People sometimes separate themselves, artists very often separate themselves from the patronage base anyway, even though you know, they know that they depend on those people for their finances. With Luna, um, um, I mean, Balaguer, for example, was, is, a, is a very important industrialist and lib in the 19th century sense, liberal colonialist. So he, there were, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sort of entry into liberal entrepreneurial classes in Spain, which allows uh, Saleh to, uh, allows Luna to display himself. And they also supported him because of that. When he, after he murdered his wife in Paris uh, and was let off by the French court because they thought it was a crime of passion, there's all kinds of interpretations about this. Clearly, page, you know, popular newspaper kind of story. Um, but he was given this uh, quite extensive access to a steel making factory. Who was, he was patron, patronized by this uh, steel maker in, in Bilbao. In North, that's northern Spain, of course. So, um, whether, uh, I'm, I'm not sure who his patronage class in the Philippines were, but certainly his wife's family, uh, Luna's wife's family, were very rich and were able to sell. And, and some of those people who went to Rome were members of the Filipino Estrado elite, um, which is very, very small. 
And that's part of the problem of the Filipino oligarchy, that it is so small. They're on the verge of becoming pressure on classes, which is what Luna becomes a member of. But the people who actually patronize them are, are really very small in number. But almost universally anti-clerical. I mean, you know, if you take uh, Rizal as the genius exemplar, um, they, they hated the, the friars. And of course they would hate the friars because the friars wouldn't teach them Spanish. So here you are, you're going to dominate us, but we're not going to let you learn the language of colonial domination to fight back. The ones who did, who went to Spain, lived in Europe from the rich, the very few people who could master Castilian, they were, they were very privileged. And of course there's a whole moment, I don't, I don't know if you know much about the politics of Spain, there's a whole series of moments about which should Spain become more liberal on a kind of British constitutional model or should it you know, become more repressive on a sort of Catholic domination model. They, and of course they've got all these kind of things to inherit from their history as we saw with the suppression of Granada for example. That these are, maybe there wasn't enough time to escape from these things in the 19th century. I don't know. And of course, uh, uh, the other thing we haven't really discussed or mentioned was um, the Philippines was ruled from Spain. It wasn't ruled from Latin America, which it had been up until... 1820, you said. 1820, or thereabouts, yes. I mean, there's a, there's a debate about this when it actually started, but 1820, shall we say. Um, uh, it was ruled as a province of Mexico. Because the, the economy of the Spanish side of the economy of the Philippines was to send silver from Mexico to Madrid, this famous Manila Galleon, and that was converted into cash goods, which the Chinese sent to Manila, silks, other kinds of raw natural products, which were then sent back to, uh, to Mexico and then traded to Europe because they were up higher value added. So this, uh, the, and of course the, <laughs> the Spanish silver is very important because that's the currency of East Asia from 1450 through to uh, 1850 or thereabouts. Uh, it's before the British, before the American dollar, before any of those sorts of interventions. That's Prof. Hyde. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just uh, two questions. Uh, you mentioned uh, very briefly decolonization decolonization I think in the context of Luna um, could you could you say more about that what, 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 to what extent um, what, what are the themes of decolonization in Luna and 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 Radin Saleh um, uh, particularly when it comes to the the two paintings of uh, Pinaman and, and Saleh so to, to, to what extent is decolonization important if it at all uh, it is important that's the first question. Second question uh, concerns your shot at Edward Said. Um, could you explain what you mean? Um, you, you made, an, uh, I think it's an important uh, claim that he distorted, uh, what did you say, the idea of the text or something. I'd be interested to know what you actually mean by that. Could you just say that second question again, please? I haven't quite got it. Well, it concerns your shot at, at Said. Oh, Saeed. You, you took a shot at Saeed. No, I didn't take a shot. I read both books very carefully in detail. For no, a long time, I read a very yeah. critique, which has been ignored. So I no, 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 no. I, I, I'm, I'm not... Sorry. I, 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 no, what I want to understand is what exactly do you mean by his distorting... Uh, what, what is your critique? I'd like to understand well, I think your critique. No, I don't think we should turn this into a critique of Saeed. I mean, he was a great person, and his political views on the Middle East I happen to agree with, but that's, that's beside the point. I mean, he distorted the notion of the text. Yes, I just wanted to understand what you mean by that. That's my question. Well, if you read Orientalism, you'll find he regards a speech in the House of Commons, a poem by somebody, a novel by somebody else, a diary record by somebody else who's spent half their life learning Arabic, as in the same discourse. Well, they're not. That's a distortion, in my view. And it's also a kind of contempt from someone whose book, Orientalism, quotes from one, or is it two, Arabic sources. Or it's a criticism of your European attitude to the Middle East. And he uses people who spent their lifetime identifying with Arabic and more generally Islamic culture from Europe, spending their lifetime in the Middle East. I mean, you know, it's kind of like 
sitting in an, uh, sitting in an armchair watching in a travel advertisement about some other country you've actually been to and thinking, why, how on earth can they think of these people like this? It's, it's travel, uh, it's critique of travel journalism or travel literature. It's really nonsense. And it's so besotted, the Western Academy, and the reason it's besotted it is, as mm. Simon has... Didn't he qualify as well that there are different sort of like range of scholarship depending on whether it's Germanic or French? And I think he's mentioned quite early on in his Well, he earlier, I don't think he doesn't understand German. He, he talks about French, he, he does mention French sources because he regards himself as interesting. Do you know he went to the same school as um, um, uh, the famous English female literary critic? Uh, does anybody remember her name? Uh, who wrote the book on the Arabian Nights? There's an English female literary critic who wrote a very insightful book on the Arabian Nights. Uh, Mar Mar Marina Warner, is that right? Yeah, they went to the same high school in, in, um, in Cairo, by the way. I know, I mean, you know, it's very irritating to have to disagree fundamentally with somebody whose political views you agree with. But there it is, I mean, you have to say that. And, and his methodology is suspect. And I, I, I mean, I know because I subject, submitted an article on a Japanese painting problem history painting problem, to an art history journal in the United Kingdom, and I was accused of Orientalism for naming a Chinese musical n mode by its name in Chinese. That was regarded as Orientalist. But that's not the kind of anti-Orientalism that Said uh, engages in. Well, that's no, that, that it's not necessarily, but then, yeah. you know, I've, I mean, there are good books by Said, but that's not one of them. And, but the problem is it's the most influential one. The good, the late, late, late form is a very good book, and the book on his PhD on Conrad is very good, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, you can go on talking about that if you read, read people seriously, but not Orientalism. I'm sorry. Mm. Yeah, well, as you said, it's not perhaps the time to. No, it is. No, yeah, right, you're but, quite but right. I, I am mean, very passionate about to, it. But to, I be on, to be honest with you, I am very surprised. That, <laughs> sorry. I say I'm passionate about it, but I shouldn't necessarily bring my passion to this table. Yeah. No, no, it's, it, it, I actually would be very interested, interested to discuss it. I actually happen to strongly disagree with you. Um, well, there's lots I of think people the book do. I just have my with me, you know, in, in yeah. India. I mean, there's lots of people who agree with me. I'm could I introduce the two of you later? And then Th that's <laughs> right. But anyway, any, anyway could, you, yeah. could you say something yeah. about the decolonization uh, question? Um, yeah. Well, the, the problem about decolonization is we think of decolonization as what happens after they lose. Or if they don't quite lose, what happens after they go? You know, which make more, more unifies, versalizes the problem. And which tends to be, produces a mentality that what happens before they go or before they lose, that's to say the white colonizers, lose or, or go, is a kind of domination where people have no flexibility with cultural form and no way of integrating themselves into a new kind of cultural formation. A hybrid cultural formation necessarily, sometimes a hybrid com 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 cultural formation between different cultures which were close to each other but didn't really talk to each other, as you might perhaps say was the case in parts of Southeast Asia, I don't know. I, I wouldn't make that judgment, but you, know, you could say that. And um, what happens with these painters, and there are lots of others I could mention, but we won't go into it, is they take what they need at the time that they need it to find a way of expressing visually their, ex their experience of the world. And they do it through, as all painters, using painters as a, as a kind of, and it obviously it's problematic, but no, it's a metaphor for art, as a, or as a modality of art, which we use as an example for other kinds of, of art. They take this at a time when there's a dominant structure of military and political and cultural domination imposed from another center. Now, are we talking about Mughal India or are we talking about British rule in Malaysia? I don't know. I mean, you know, that, when you start thinking like that about it, you stop thinking about the colonialism we know. We, you start thinking about, oh, what happens when people meet across, and sometimes people try to mobilize forms across cultural boundaries through difference, through, I mean, you couldn't think of anything more different than Hindu, Hindu uh, painting before the Mughals, and the Mughal painting is came from Persia. You can think of it, but the, the Indian, Indian painters did Mughal painting. 
um, very well. I had no problem with it. Yeah, of course, they inflected it, they changed the, if you like, the visual feel, they changed the color sensibility, and so on. So there's all sorts of things they did, but they made it their own, or they found a way of doing it and being true to themselves. So this is not a, this is, you know, we, we're besotted by the 19th century, uh, or by Trump, or some kind of metaphor for American colonialism, but in fact, this is not a new thing. This has happened when cu dominant cultures occupy areas which don't belong to them necessarily, or which are only... So I, 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 I think what's happening in the 19th century, to go back to your serious issue, it's a serious issue. What's happening in the 19th century is these artists are saying, here are my love painting, or I love visual representation, or something or other like that, and I'm good at it, and I've been trained at it since a child, and I just work within the discourse that I'm provided with. And then I turn it to the subject matter, which people recognise, or I turn it to the position of the artist, which may be concealed from the audience. The audience may not realise the joke, the joke, the irony that's been played on them. Sometimes it's a joke. I mean, you've got, you only have to look at Harry Donner or some other contemporary Indian artists nice to know there's a joke being played on the international uh, consumption class that by their stuff, you know, I mean, quite clearly. And it's, it's subtle, it's not easy. Or maybe it's a Darwin intuition. <laughs> so you're saying that allegory is an important kind of, allegory allegory is very important important kind of device. It's right? not simply a picture of, you know, the raw, the, 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 the cis archetypal family fleeing from the tiger, or about to be pounced on by the tigers. It's not sim simply that story, it's a sort of, some other kind of story about the role of the tigers, the family, the son, Indonesian heritage, or heritage of, archeti of, of architectural monuments in, in, in Java, which are all being brought together and put in a little conversation. And what the conversation is, is sometimes not very clear, and sometimes it's deliberately subtle to hide it from you know, people who wouldn't necessarily like the picture. And sometimes this is a message which is being sent to the first, I mean, not a lot of Radha and Salish paintings were sent or bought by European aristocrats and Dutch, Dutch state as well. And the royal family, or given to the Dutch royal family. So they're a message to the Dutch, clearly. But what the message is and how it's done all the time is not always clear. Can we have one last question on the floor? No more questions? No more? Okay. <laughs> ah, yeah, Daniel, please. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, two little questions. Uh, between the two, who had uh, better student or successors or followers and you also made a point about the difference between modern and contemporary art about some m contemporary art not putting putting concept ahead or something yes. like that. could you yes. elaborate a little bit thank you um, I've always had a problem because I, I'm, I was trained as a, uh, as a social scientist not as an art historian so I'm always thinking about structures I'm not thinking about current phenomena only. I'm thinking about where these things fit into other kinds of structures which we don't always see or that we have only inadequate ways of arguing the links with or links between. Um, as for this, so, so that's a difference of position from the usual kind of art historians into iconography and um, you know what somebody was thinking when they got out of the bath or something and painted something. Um, so the first question uh, uh, is a question about um, successors. Um, physical successors with artists are difficult sometimes to denote if they don't have a coterie or an institution which allows them to train people. Saleh had two, as we know, far, probably three and a few more pupils, two of whom were direct and uh, indirect pupils through this teacher training system, the Dutch set four, is it four or I can't remember the name, but about four teacher training academies to which only the PIE could go, only the aristocrats could go. And whether that was an anticipation of the Taman Siswa, the People's Garden system, or opposed to it, there's all sorts of problems about Indonesian education under the Dutch, which to a non-specialist are not clear, to me anyway. Um, so I think probably that the drawing techniques, which you could see he already knew that they had to be trained, so he produced his lithographs in the 1862, was it? Um, he, uh, long, time, long time before uh, there were these opportunities in the teacher training academies, 
that they, he may have, in terms of representation of imagery, have produced exemplars. But the problem with uh, the Dutch uh, relationship to Indonesian art is, of course, Sudoyono, who said, so long as you do it with the Indonesian spirit, it's okay, basically. Yeah, so you are kickoff. Um, but, uh, um, but don't do any of that awful colonial stuff. So, in fact, the whole of the problem, was, and, and, and because of the loss of Dutch as a language in the Indonesian intellectual class, the disadvantage, apparently, with regard to the colonial language of English, you do not suffer from. Yes. <laughs> anyway, we've got a common language, haven't we? But the Dutch, the, the Indonesian intellectual class, very few of them have got a common intellectual language, the language of their colonial oppressors. Very few, very, it's disappeared. All of this information about Rad and Sella has been, re has been reconstituted by one French and one German, a little bit by me, basically these two, who read German and French and Dutch. They, they reconstitute it. It doesn't exist anywhere. Um, so people are shut off from what the actual substance of the art historical transmission was, let alone what later ideological positions were adopted by people from Prasagi and so forth. That was your first question. The second question was, I made a little kind of aside about conceptualism and contemporary art. Um, one of the frustrations of doing art history from a structuralist position is that you can become separated from the reality of the artworks, or what people thought were artworks, or what later societies, audiences, intellectual structures have constituted as artworks. Because they're not, you know, I mean, we do reassess, we do replace, we take things from prehistoric tombs and put them in museums, you know, and ban representations of the Venus of Willendorf from the internet. Because it's not art, it's pornography. Uh, this kind of thing goes on all the time in art, but particularly severe in uh, the imaging ecology we have now. Um, but, um, it does seem to me that when artists are working through a particular discipline, a particular practice, which involves the production of images or objects in reality, in the, in the real world, as, as physical objects, which then the audience reconstitute in some kinds of viewing environments, obviously, and with certain kinds of viewing codes, often class controlled, but never mind, they still reconstitute them as art objects. When that happens, you're in a different relationship to the art object when if you think this sentence on the wall or this diary representation of what I was thinking when I got out of bed this morning or, you know, I mean, Tracy Amin, the obvious English example, there's plenty of them, constitutes a route to the art object, uh, I have real problems with that. And if you might, you might say, I mean, if I, if I mentioned to you that Duchamp is more than 100 years old, would that be relevant to a contemporary artist? Duchamp is over 100 years old. You know, 1913, come on. Nearly 150 years old soon. So uh, this is, uh, but the, 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 somehow the, this relationship between what we do with art now and what we use as exemplars or prior, prior precursors and so forth is, is somehow a language of philosophical discourse rather than a language of, or should I say, conceptual discourse, perhaps, rather than a language of the objects and the positions about the objects as they were produced, seems to me a fallacy. But I, I mean, I don't want to be too, I don't want to be anti-conceptual because I, because I like conceptual jokes like anybody else. And I, like work, I like looking at, I like looking at, you know, uh, who can we think of that's uh, relevant? I like looking at FX, Harsonos, installation of a, um, pictures from an Islamic household in, where was it, Aceh? I don't know. I've not seen the, that. Yeah, there's a big, there's a big work, 2013, which is, you wouldn't, you, it's not simply a representation of an Islamic household, it's a representation of the conceptual possibility of understanding that, is, that household and its aesthetic through the videos and the objects in the space and so forth and so forth. So conceptualism is, I mean, it's like saying what's the underlying idea of the work, but conceptualism became an ideology of ignorance, mm -hmm. actually, basically. Yeah.
I think that's a nice note to end today's sort of like lecture. Please give me, uh, please join me in thanking sort of like John Park for this afternoon's lecture. Thank you very much, John. Um, I do have a public service announcement. No, we, uh, we have to wish you a, ha a safe and happy flight, don't yeah, we? Yeah, I'm safe and happy flight for me too, but actually more importantly, a public service announcement. Some colleagues and actually a few colleagues and I have been working uh, quite hard last night to put together a statement from the arts, uh, from members of the arts, Malaysian arts and culture community, uh, which we hope to sort of like send off uh, to our new sort of like government uh, by tomorrow, right? Chidu, am I right? So I'm going to sort of like briefly sort of read to you this statement in the hope that you will help, you will join us together in signing, uh, uh, putting your name down. Uh, in support of this statement uh, at the tablet which is located on the counter of Ilham Gallery. Uh, okay, so we, the undersigned members of the Malaysian arts and culture community, urge the newly elected Pakatan Haratwan government to restore the standing of arts, culture, heritage in Malaysia by guaranteeing a ministerial portfolio dedicated to these sectors in the new cabinet. In an inclusive Malaysia, we believe that creative expressions cultural traditions, and our tangible and intangible heritage can play a vital role in fostering a sense of shared identity and social cohesion. Critical thinking, openness to diversity, and participatory engagement are amongst the many documented benefits of arts and culture. These traits are sorely needed to help the country recuperate from the political and social upheaval of the past two decades. In the Pakatan Harapan Manifesto, the creative arts and industry is identified as an engine of growth, particularly for the youth. Indeed, arts and culture and heritage have, been the potential, have the potential to contribute to economic growth of the nation, given sufficient planning and support. The Pakatan Harapan Manifesto also identifies art activities as supporting work-life balance. Importantly, Pakatan Harapan has placed great, emphasis, uh, great significance in restoring our ability to exercise freedom of speech and expression, thought and opinion in Malaysia as part of its mandate, recognizing this to be an important factor in a healthy and functioning democratic nation. Malaysian arts and cultural makers, workers and educators, both from the peninsula and Borneo states, have been the critical voice of honesty, hope, and change from the very early days of the anti-colonial movement, true to every major social, economic, and political shift in our history. Malaysia needs its arts and culture communities now more than ever. The abuses of power, neglect, and cynical use of the instrument of the state to foster distrust amongst the people needs to be redressed. Cultural diversity flourishing within a framework of democ democracy and mutual respect between peoples and cultures that also values indigenous knowledge and practices is essential for peace, well-being, and development at the local, national, and international levels. Having a dedicated ministry will help ensure that arts, culture, and heritage can fully play its unique and critical role in supporting this nation's journey towards transformation. Under the previous administration, heritage was dropped from all ministerial portfolios in 2009, while arts was removed in 2011. We urge the newly installed government to reinstate a dedicated ministry of culture, arts, and heritage, and we look forward to engaging with the appointed minister in the spirit of openness and common good. Common good. So um, if you're interested in supporting this uh, statement, uh, we have a tablet on the counter. Please sort of like put your name down and um, join us in this sort of like uh, uh, call. Thank you very much. <laughs>